Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at LAM Research with David Fried. We're going to talk today about AI in the semiconductor equipment ecosystem. David, where does AI fit into the manufacturing equipment ecosystem? Uh, okay, AI is a, is a huge topic. Um, it's a bit of a buzzword and it includes a lot of different things. Uh, it can go anywhere from data, data engineering, analytics, data visualization, all the way to you know, machine learning, generative technology, and there's a pretty big range uh, across the AI uh, spectrum. When I think of AI, I think in the semiconductor ecosystem, when we think about AI, we're really focused on the application of any of those technologies to solve very specific problems. Uh, I tend to focus a lot of my time on using AI and using those technologies to solve R&D problems, to accelerate innovation both in process and equipment. But AI also has lots of applications in the fab, on the equipment, and in services for, uh, for that equipment in a manufacturing environment. Let's take a closer look. Sure. David, what are we looking at? Okay, I just wanted to add some context uh, to some of the things I said about applications in the equipment ecosystem. So on this side of the chart, we have the Semiverse Solutions. This is what I tend to think about most of the time. And here's where we're applying some of these technologies, whether it's simulation, modeling, uh, machine learning, in order to accelerate our research and development of processes and equipment for LAM research. So the real objective here is to produce differentiated equipment and differentiated process uh, for the marketplace. And there's a lot more processes these days. They're coming out a lot faster than any time in the past, right? Absolutely. And, and that's why we have to virtualize and why we have to employ some of these technologies. Whereas, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we would be working on a singular etch process or, or deposition process. Now, the number of etch and deposition and clean applications that we're working on has ballooned. We're working on many more of these processes and we're trying to implement them much faster into the industry than ever before. And within those processes, there's new materials. You have a lot of one-off type processes that are sort of customized for large vendors too, right? Yeah, so the diversity in the process set is, is really significant. If you look across logic, DRAM, NAND, specialty technology markets, advanced packaging, there's so many different processes that we're working on all at the same time. And really the only way to accelerate that activity is to do it more in a virtual world instead of the time consuming trial and error um, methods that, of the past. So where does AI fit into this? Okay, so again, AI, it's a huge category. Is it simulation? Is it data engineering and analytics? Is it machine learning and generative? Um, yes, it's all of those. And I th think when we look at um, R&D acceleration, this is where we're applying a lot of simulation technology, a lot of uh, advanced analytics, but in an R&D environment where we don't have a ton of data. And so we have to do our machine learning and AI in small and sparse data sets in a very different way than you might think of in high volume manufacturing. And there's continuity here too from the process into say the reactor, right? So the, where does this, how does this actually work where you're building something over here, designing it and then moving it over into the reactor and the chamber and whatever else you, wherever else you're moving? So we tend to think of different scales of, of AI or different scales of virtual twins. Um, a lot of times we're starting at the device scale or the process scale where we're, we're thinking just about what is the transistor or the memory structure that our customer wants to make and how do we virtualize that and virtualize our process implications on that structure. Once we understand uh, the process and the structure and the device we're trying to create, we need to build reactors that can implement that and can implement those processes. And then we start to expand the scale of the virtual twin that we're developing in order to accelerate that innovation. So we talk about the chamber scale or the reactor scale of our virtual twins. Eventually that connects up to the system scale and the fab scale or the fleet of systems and the fab scale and the same type of virtual twin capabilities or the models and the predictive aspects of this can extend from all the way down from the device and the atomic scale all the way up into the equipment and the fab. How does the data fit into this? You've got lots of different data. That data has to be good, but it also has to be cleaned up as you go along too, right? Well, so again, in an R&D environment, 
we don't have a lot of data. We have some data, we do some experimental work, and we use that data in very specific ways to optimize the process and optimize the equipment. A lot of that data gets used to validate and calibrate some of our more physics-based models. But again, the, the data sets in R&D are often small and sparse. As we start to move more towards manufacturing, as our systems are in fabs, operating in high volume manufacturing, the data sets get cleaner, more controlled, and obviously much larger. And so the types of AI and the types of algorithms we're able to employ in those environments can change pretty significantly relative to an R&D environment. These are pretty much living, breathing type of things though, right? Because they're, as you start doing things like a, uh, a digital twin, you have to be monitoring this as it goes forward. Absolutely. And so the, the digital twin of any of these reactors or any of these processes is constantly evolving and growing. As we have a deeper understanding of the different mechanisms at play, we enhance these models. As we generate more data and we calibrate and we validate, the models evolve and improve in their predictive capability. And so uh, as the process evolves, the virtual twin evolves. As the equipment evolves, the virtual twin evolves. And so these things basically have to stay in lockstep. Uh, as you develop them in an R&D environment, but also then as they're implemented and, uh, and deployed in a manufacturing environment. Because you do have limited data here, what can you actually learn from that? What can you do with it and how does that apply going forward? Yes, yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question because it totally depends on the, the time frame or the, the point in the life cycle here. I think when we're talking about very early on in either process or equipment engineering, you don't have a lot of data. You haven't tried this, you haven't built this, you haven't executed in the lab. So you have to rely more on first principles physics. Uh, this is where we do a lot more simulation, uh, but you have to eventually validate those simulations against some data, some hardware. And so when we're early in that phase where we have very, very little data, we're relying more on physics, what we're trying to achieve is, is more of a strategy, an equipment strategy or a process strategy, a set of steps or a set of processes to execute a specific specification. As we start to get more data and we, we have prototype tools and we are operating in a lab and we're starting to collect some data, it becomes really useful to refine those models, but also search for some effects that we're not modeling with our physical models. We start to get that data, we start to enhance our understanding of the process, but at the end of the day, we're never going to have enough data to fully depend on data to do uh, real development. The number of parameters we can use to develop these recipes and these equipment, the number of parameters has exploded. And so we're never going to be able to do enough experiments and create enough data across that massive parameter space. So we have to be joining our physics understanding with our data and our optimization. And using those two in concert becomes really the trick or the special recipe of doing AI in an R&D environment. How much of this really results in something that is useful versus, oh, we just tried this, it didn't work. Well, so what's interesting is what we're often finding in simulation early on is uh, opportunities or, or options that won't work. And when you start a project and you're thinking of strategies and you may have seven different ideas of how to meet a spec, if we can use virtualization to eliminate five of those seven focus on the two that do have a path to the specification, that makes us much more efficient, that cuts down our cycle time and really accelerates our innovation. So often we're using simulation and AI to rule out options or paths that won't reach target. And that's actually as valuable as, the, as finding something that does work, right? Because now you understand, okay, this doesn't work and we found that in all these different situations, this won't work. So let's just move beyond it or, or completely change our strategy. Yeah, um, options that won't get to the path are really expensive, right? Because you end up building prototypes, you end up doing demos, you end up spending time and resources in the lab chasing a path that won't have a solution. And so uh, pruning dead branches, as we like to say, is a tremendous accelerant. Then you can really focus your resources. You can focus your equipment builds, your lab resources, and your time on options that you know from simulation do have a path to the target. So what are the steps here? How does this actually go together? Um, how about I show you? All right, we, we typically think about a lot of these problems, uh, as, a lot of these modeling problems or AI problems as, uh, as simply a step between inputs and outputs. And so if, if you think about um, a, a process or a reactor, there's some black box and you're going to put inputs into it. And those inputs might be your 
process recipe or the tool configuration or the what's on the wafer before you start. And the output you're usually interested in is what is on the wafer after you run that process. So that, that's sort of the general, the black box virtualization of a piece of equipment. And there's, there's some function of these input variables that leads to that output. That output is what our customers want us to deliver to them. A piece of equipment that runs a process that meets their spec. We spend a lot of time building what we call the forward model, where if I apply a certain set of inputs, a certain recipe, a certain tool configuration, a certain wafer state, into that model, I can predict the output. That's step one, building the forward model. Once we have that, we, we work to invert this model. Instead of being able to predict an output, I want to specify the output. So now I have a specification for the output. That's the, what the customer wants us to deliver. And if we can invert this model, it tells me what inputs need to be applied to hit that spec. That's the reverse problem. Does that give you a much more robust model the way they do that? Uh, the model itself maybe doesn't change. It's simply just the inversion of that model. Um, all of the data and all of the physics and all the simulation that we use to create the model still forms the, the foundation of that. But now once we've inverted it, instead of searching for the right set of inputs to get an output, we invert the problem, we specify the output, and it delivers the input. Once we've inverted the problem, then we can automate that process and really start looking for solutions in all parts of the process space. Does that allow you to take this model and say, okay, we can do other things with this. We can, we can create derivatives of this for different applications. Absolutely. Um, so in an R&D environment, this tells us uh, how to set up a process in order to hit a customer spec. It accelerates our process engineering. But then you might take that model and want to implement it in manufacturing where the customer needs to control the tool to hit a certain spec as the inputs are varying. So maybe there's some variation on the state of the different wafers that are coming to the tool from prior processing. We can build a model, and specifically that inverted model, to alter the process inputs to continue meeting the same output spec. So that's two different applications of the same inverted process model. With AI, you have different models. Potentially, you can leverage one from another, though, right? How does that actually go together? Yeah, so actually, where this leads to is we're building models for our equipment and our processes, and we know we can, we can predict our, the behavior of our, our equipment and our processes. We can invert them and let the customers really optimize from there. But what our customers really want is they want to be able to do this for every piece of equipment in the fab. They want to put models together for every stage of the process and have them interoperable so that they can predict and optimize their fabs not just individual tools and processes. That opens up a whole new set of problems and challenges that we need to solve, not just within one company, but as an industry. And you're looking at everything from variation to whatever process they have to be using for a specific step in that manufacturing process, right? It's the entire flow. Absolutely. So, you know, a fab flow has depositions and etch and litho and CMP and all these different steps. Each one of those processes specific to a technology node or routing is going to have different models and different optimization capabilities and frankly different applications different process problems uh, uniformity or cross wafer uniformity or defectivity and you're going to want to solve those individual problems but you're going to want to do that in a fab wide perspective so you're going to need to join these these forward and inverted models from all the steps between the steps to solve all the different problems that a fab needs to solve. This sounds simple on paper, but it isn't. How do the pieces really go together? What can go wrong? Yeah, so one of the challenges here is uh, everybody's doing this differently, right? And so obviously uh, many customers and in LAM particularly, we're using software platforms like Simulator 3D for process modeling and device modeling, platforms like VizGlow for the reactor scale modeling. Uh, so we have those advanced capabilities, but putting this together for fab-wide perspective is going to require certain standardization. Um, 
being able to pass a description of a wafer from model to model, the same way it passes from tool to tool in the fab, is going to require everybody to agree on a set of standards for how to describe that wafer and how to describe the compute system that puts these models together. This is all new. Um, we're just starting to work on this and uh, we're hoping to take some of the lessons learned on the design side of our industry um, and the EDA tools and the EDA platforms that have been able to put lots of these different disciplines together in the same simulation platform um, and standardize how that data is described across those platforms. One of the big challenges here has been who owns the data, how does that get shared? Does this address some of that? Well, this is the, the, the battleground for some of this is uh, if I have a perfect model for my piece of equipment and it's generating data, is that data owned by the fab? Is it owned by the equipment owner? And I think part of this standardization that I'm talking about is we're going to have to figure out where the layers of ownership lie. And I think there will be certain data that will need to be black boxed for the equipment providers, uh, certain amounts of data that need to be, say, white boxed for the fab and for the owner of that equipment, and maybe there's some gray box in the middle depending on the certain applications or technology being uh, employed. These are the types of questions that we really don't have answers for, and we need to come together as an industry. All the equipment suppliers, the fab owners, the software providers, we need to figure out how to identify those problems, segment that data, define some ownership, and define standards for handling that data. There's another layer that goes on top of this too, which is that you may create new data that was never possible individually. And so who owns that as well? Yeah, absolutely. The cool part about virtualization is we may be able to understand things that we simply can't understand in the fab, in, in the real world. Uh, the examples, when I think of a simulator 3D model of a device and a structure and a process, I have the ability to interrogate that virtual model and measure things and understand things in that virtual model that aren't visible on the wafer with existing metrology techniques in the fab. So we're able to actually create not just data that mirrors the data in the fab, but maybe a whole new set of data that's more advanced or more detailed than what we're generating in the fab. That data potentially becomes very, very valuable for optimizing processes and optimizing devices and structures in the fab, we may be able to not just accelerate innovation in individual processes, but innovation in the fab and in the entire device structure that's being produced. David Fried, as always, thanks for a great explanation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ed.